property and property investments are one of the most important things when we are talking shelter, which is a basic need to every human. Tonight we are talking sustainable residential properties and this is going to be a very interesting conversation. Welcome to the Private Property Podcast. My name is Tumi. Let's unpack. My guest tonight is the founder of Bono Property Investments, and he's going to be taking us through the challenges that they have had, the ups and the downs of starting a, uh, a property investment organization. His name is Mulalo Chide. Ma, Mulalo, good evening, and thank you so much for joining us. Good evening. Thank you very much for giving me this opportunity. Yeah, in, in Chivenda, we say in Dimadeguana, right? Yes, in Dimadeguana. Abu <laughs> Thank you so much. <laughs> Let's jump straight into our conversation tonight and talk Bono Property Investments. Um, what do you do and how exactly do you contribute to sustainable residential properties? Uh, Bono Property Investment, uh, our main focus is development, property development. Uh, this is the company that was founded in 2018. Uh, I'm the co-founder together with my partner, who is also my wife, Patricia Chitemu. We started this uh, journey in 2018 together. And the reason for starting this was to just uh, play a role or contribute in the community development. Uh, the reason how it came, uh, there was a day where I was just reading an article about a shortage of student accommodation on the newspaper. And then I took that to my wife and we discussed about it. She, maybe it is time we start our own business mm. uh, because I can see there is a need on the side of student accommodation. For me, it was easy because I grown up in a built environment where my parents were contractors. So I learned how to do building when I was very young. Mm. So that's why it became easy even when we saw this opportunity to say, let's start this. And then together with my wife, we started by purchasing one house where we let in some students. I think the first one was 11 students. And then we agree on purchasing a house each and every year where we keep on buying, buying, and then letting students in. Sure. No, thank you so much for that. And let's talk about what informed the segmentation that you currently have in terms of the projects that you run. You know, you, as you said, you have student accommodation, but you also have rental accommodation and um, are giving provision or, or allowing people now to, uh, to have access to affordable housing. Um, what informed that decision? Um, I'm hearing you're talking about um, the, the student accommodation specifically. At what point did you now decide, oh, let's now add um, this, this residential and rental property? Oh, I can say that the rental was uh, driven back but when I started working. Mm. Uh, my first uh, rental house was in Pulukwane. What happened there, it was my first job. I got a job and then because I was already in the building environment with my father, I bought a house. But immediately after buying a house, I got a job which was forcing me to go out of the country. Mm. Then I people to I ask people to stay in my house and then while they're staying in my house they found some tenants and then that was the beginning of uh, providing rental apartments and since then uh, we have been doing that when we come to Joburg we had a, pro a, a, a flat that we were renting people and then since then the, 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 the interest of rental keep on growing and growing and growing until when we saw the gap of student accommodation. And then through then, uh, we, we attend some courses where mm. we now start to learn about the, the di different strategies on, on, on of providing the accommodation. That's where we decided to have different roles where we even look at afford affordable housing. Sure. And, you know, a lot of people start like that. A lot of people start their property journey, you know, very small. And when they, they were doing it as something we, called a, we call a side hustle, and now it, be, it becomes um, a, a fully-fledged business, what advice would you give to somebody who is now transitioning or is in the point of transitioning from becoming something that they, do it, they did as a side hustle to it becoming a formal, legitimized business? 
the, the advice I can give is that whether you are treating as a side hustle, you need to make sure that you are doing things properly. One thing that was a secret between me and my partner is from the beginning, what we were doing, we will have a, a structured, we will buy a company, uh, um, a house using a company, we form a formal company, and then we will do all that is necessary. We'll have an accountant who will check our books, we'll have everything in order. So by the time we went to say we want to buy a, a bigger property or another property, because we have a good trend, we have everything in order. It was easy for, for, for I mean, for the bank to consider us as a property people, even though we were still full time at our work. We, I, I, I resigned full time from my work in 2020, whereas my wife just resigned uh, last year. But our company has been there. We have been trading and working under company. Mm -hmm. So my biggest advice is that, that whether it's small or what, just make sure that you follow the rules, you do it accordingly. And you sure. respect one that was good is whatever money we're generating, because we have this bigger vision, we had to keep it and we, we were not using it to sustain our life. Mm. By the time we decided to grow, my company was already having some money there and then it has a good financial standing also. Sure. Also. Let's, talk, let's talk a little bit more about the challenges that you're facing in the property space um, that are unique, of course, to, to each and every single person, to each and every single portfolio manager or portfolio investor or even uh, somebody who's coming in or who's been in the property industry for, for a while. What are some of those challenges that you faced and that um, you've curbed or even surmounted that you, can, you, you, can, you could uh, ascribe as lessons learned? Uh, with the challenges, uh, there are quite many, just like any other industry, mm. there is a lot of challenges. As we were transitioning from buying, uh, we, we encounter a lot of uh, challenges when we say we are now starting to develop. Because what we have done now, we said, yes, we have been renting, renting, but we want a bigger uh, a building. That's where we, in 2018, we decided to to start uh, applying for funds. And then in 2019, towards the end of the year, we were granted a, a, a loan to build a 60 million project, which is the biggest student accommodation, which can accommodate about 376 students. The challenges there was from the beginning, because years I had a little bit knowledge of uh, construction, but there were a lot of things that uh, one encounter from, you need to understand uh, the, 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 the rules of construction, what needs to be done uh, in terms of the plan, what approval are necessary. I remember one of the unique one was the, uh, the one for EIA. So we were not aware about it. And then as we were starting to build, one of a friend asked me about it. She said, did you check if your area is exempted for EIA? And then I was not aware. Lucky enough, when we check our area, we were a little bit less than one hectare, which gave us a chance to be exempted. We applied for an exemption and it was done. Quickly, within a month, it was done and we, could, we were not stopped. And what I've realized, if we were not uh, in an area where it is exempted, we're supposed to be stopped and go and do the whole EIA, which can take a year or two. Mm -hmm. So we were really lucky. So from there, whenever I go to a new project, I make sure that I'm lying in all the things before I can start laying the brick, because that can be a, a a very big problem there. It's a lot of uh, projects that have been stopped because of that. Some of the uh, challenges might be you buy the land without checking the availability of bulk services. You go and apply. When you are about to uh, uh, to, to start building or when you send the, your, your, your plan for approval, they told you that there is no enough electricity or water in the area. And then sure. you're stuck with the land. You cannot do anything mm -hmm. on it. 
And there are challenges like also the communities. When you go to an area, when you want to start, people always feel like uh, uh, they need to, all of them, they need to get employment, they need to benefit the project. There are issues where people will tell you they need 30% of the project. So one needs to be in a position when you can engage the people and talk to them. Just to give an example, when we were building this, we had the issue for the community where they wanted the 30% also. And then the way we solved that was to say, no problem, we work with you. And then we're supposed to build the 11 blocks. And then we we talked to the main contractor to say, okay, there is there should be some blocks which should be built by the community. Mm. And they see the community and they select the builder from the local and they give them the 30% share where they should build. And because of that, it makes the, uh, the process run smoothly. Really does sound like sustainable residential there because, you know, we, we are putting the these in, into the community, so we need to ensure that we are integrating well. You spoke a little bit about an EIA earlier on. Could you just explain what an EIA is for somebody who's watching us today and doesn't really understand what it is? It's, a, it's an environmental assessment management. So normally what they will do, uh, the environmental people, they will come and assess your area. If it's it's not within the, they have a, the categories where they, they said, let's say you have a stream or you have a wetland. They will categorize to say, this is a, a, a no-go area. You cannot build on this area. If you are building here, this is what you should do. They will give you some demarcation to say, if it, there's a stream or wetland, you cannot build, let's say 50 meters uh, closer to it, or you cannot do this and that. And these areas are already demarcated with the department. Mm. So you put that in, in consideration when you go, because you will find people go, just start building. And then the next thing is the area which is demarcated. Or another thing, it's, uh, it might be zoned for something else. Mm. And then you go and buy it from somebody. When you go and then you find that that area is not allowed, you are not allowed to, to build, let's say, a certain uh, density. If I said yes. I need to to build a three store three story house, and then you find that the area is zoned only for farming, so it means that you need to go start by rezoning and all those stuff. So uh, that environmental impact assessment, including the zoning and all those things, those are the challenges or the things that one need to make sure that you understand fully before you can buy even purchase the land. Sure. Thank you so much for that. Very, very informative. Um, let's talk about what we should look forward for in terms of Bono um, in property investments. What are some of the projects that you are looking to go into now? Um, are, you, are you thinking or even considering going into commercial properties or any other properties um, types that you would um, consider going into in the future? Uh, our focus mainly is on residential. We haven't thought about uh, commercial. Mm. And uh, what we need to do now is to uh, uh, go around instead of focusing on Minkhauteng, because at the moment our footprint is on Minkhauteng, mm. but um, we are now uh, looking around. For instance, we are looking around Wheat Bank. We have some properties that we are looking around. We are looking into Mbombela site also. We are looking into uh, Pochestro. There are areas where we are targeting where we want to do affordable housing plus uh, the just uh, middle class to high level uh, apartments for rental. No, thank you so much for that, uh, Mulalo, and we will really be looking forward to some of the things that you're going to be doing as Bono Property Investments. Thank you so much for also joining us tonight and sharing the, the insights that you have shared with us. We really, really appreciate it. Have a good night. Thank you very much. That was good. Thank you. And that's about it for our episode tonight where we are talking sustainable residential properties, specifically looking at residential properties as well as student accommodation. We had Mr. Molalo Chitema from Bono Property Investments. Thank you also to you for staying till right till the end of the episode. Also, do remember to, to follow us on all social media platforms and stay tuned to Private Property Podcast. My name is Dumi. Have a good night. <laughs>